the network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. Ready. AV. AV Week. Performing. Scan. Week. Online. This is AV Week. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host. Uh, Some of you are already in Las Vegas. The rest of us uh, are packing currently, uh, heading up for uh, Infocom 2016. But we figured, what the heck, let's do one more AV Week right before we hit the road. First and foremost, we'll start with, uh, I almost said my my old pal, a standard. How about that? You're a standard, George. (laughs) Uh, his name is George Tucker. He works for World Stage, and he's also on my left side of my brain. How are you, sir? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'm eagerly anticipating my flight to Lost Wages. So yeah. I'll be there Monday. And I will. I, I hit the ground on Sunday at some point, so we can because we got we got a pretty good sized booth and a pretty good size. It's a twenty by twenty. It's not huge, but uh, we got a lot of stuff going on. Matt, uh, Scott, and Harry Meter are doing some good work there, along with some other folks, and we'll we'll talk about that. You get um, the pleasure of doing a booth build in hundred degree heat before they put yeah. the air conditioners on. I might uh. I might lose a pound or two. I might you know <laughs> recognize me. It was a fat joke, kids, and I can do one. Um, but I'm, but all right. Uh, two new people, and and I, I'm very excited about both of these because these are really great people I've met in the last yeah, six months or so. First up and foremost, uh, Noble Crawford. I met Noble at the PSNI marketing event uh, a couple of weeks ago. So how are you, sir? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, Tim. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll talk about where you can find some of his stuff. Uh, Noble does a bunch of really good uh, video content creation stuff. And also Rita Leitensdorfer. Uh, she is from a company called Communitronics in St. Louis. How are you, ma'am? Yes, thanks. Thanks much. Absolutely. The, uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. does some good stuff. Communitronics has been around a long time. Yes. Um, last year at this time, really quickly aside, and we'll get to the stories. Um, I did an interview with with, uh, with uh, Mr. Braun, and um, uh, Alan Braun has been in this in the industry a long time. His first job in AV, though, I believe, was it with Communitronics? So yes, it was absolutely. So yeah, they, they've been around a long time, and just it was it was a neat story. Um, actually, Alan, really stupid. And not stupid, but really six degrees of separation. Alan grew up in the same town I live in now, a little town called East Alton. Um, mm-hmm. So, anyhow. All right. Let's talk about stuff. Uh, first up and foremost, sad news. Um, actually, very surprising sad news uh, mm-hmm. out of AV. Um, one, Mr. Fred Shen. And if the last name sounds familiar, well, that's because he is uh, was the Shen of Shen, Milsom, and Wilkie. Uh, he's the founder and chairman. He passed away uh, on Tuesday. It was a sudden uh, stroke. Uh, he was 74. He had already uh, stepped down, though, uh, and started doing the transition, which is kind of where I want to go with this. Um, George, we'll start with you. One thing that, that's interesting here, and, and when you read through the, the story on AV Magazine's uh, site, uh, AV Interactive, um, Tom Shin took over uh, the role of president and CEO earlier this year. So the Fred, Fred Shin had already started the process. You know, He had already put Tom in place as president and CEO, was already going down the, the pathway of making sure that the company had a, a, uh, a strategy to move on beyond Shen, right, uh, beyond, beyond Fred. This is not the first time in the last couple of years we've, we've seen this. Um, you know, we, we've talked very, uh, a lot about um, when Mr. Feldstein passed away, the head of, of Crestron, the founder of Crestron. Some of these these strategies to move beyond the founder into the next generation and into um, the next hands, sometimes they go off flawlessly and sometimes they don't. What are some of the best things, and, and use these guys as an example because they, they did it you know six months before the, the founder passed away, what are some of the best practices of, of moving from founder to the next the next generation or the next, um, the next uh, leadership? No, that's an interesting take on it. Uh, well, first of all, d- just to recognize that a lot of our uh, major influencers in this industry are not just the people who invented the items and, mm-hmm. and made the manufacturing, but it's guys like this who really built the industry and, and made it bigger than it could have ever been imagined only 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so that uh, my, my uh, 
uh, sympathies to all those, the family and everyone like that. Uh, so, you know, handing it off, it, you know, there's a tough one, right? Because a lot of these people are that energetic. They're driven by it. They're consumed by it. And sometimes letting go, even in little bits, is very difficult. Uh, they want a team, but they also want to be in that action. And it's it's almost like being a, a soldier. You know, you, when you're finally off the battlefield, there's still that desire for that. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that, that, that there's that action, that do something. Uh, so sometimes I think it's very difficult for guys like this to offload those responsibilities to others until it's absolutely necessary or, as you said, sometimes too late and that becomes a problem. Uh, it really does come down to, I guess, being that manager and being able to say, Ooh. all right, I'm going to parse out what things need to be done that I still have a deciding factor in, but people get to do the work. And once they let go of that, I think it also becomes remarkably freeing. Wow, I can pursue all of these very interesting ideas and developments, as well as keep track of all this other stuff and make sure it's running smoothly. And so it really comes down to finding the right people and being willing to say, I'm going to delegate this kind of work to you. Run with it. Make me proud. I'm just going to keep an eye. You know, but I think the strongest part is letting go. Like that drive and knowing that you need to let go is the hardest part. Yeah. Hmm. Noble will bring this you in on this one. The reason I'm saving Rita for the end is Rita's actually done this, so we're gonna get her expertise in this. Um, Noble, from your standpoint, how do you how do you transition? How do you pass the baton? Well, Tim, I think it's uh, in this day and age. I think it's important to really kind of develop a company culture of um, you know training the next level of leadership um, and having that in place. Um, and I think that's really key. I think that, you know, George made a good point. It's about hiring the right people um, and, you know, allowing the, the leadership to be able to let go. But I think if you have a program in place that allows you to train up people, that has opportunities for growth, that has opportunities for people to train into leadership positions, that makes the transition a lot easier. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, from – you know, whether whether it's integrators or, or, or manufacturers, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people who are looking to, um, you know, to grow within their company, but the leadership has to provide those opportunities, and the earlier on they make those available, I think the, the, the better it is for the transition. It's a matter of it, get, get it done sooner rather than later, <laughs> before necessity dictates you do. Um, Rita, I mentioned the fact that you've done this. Your your dad, you know, was one of the main uh, people who started Communitronics. You've taken over the role. Um, yes. How was that transition? I mean, how and 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 you know, how was it? Because um, Rita's done very well, um, but how was that? You know, moving into two different things. First of all, taking over for someone who was who had been there for so long. It's also family too. <laughs> you know, so you've got both aspects there. Well, there's a couple things. You, the, what you need to consider is um, would I would I wish it was done differently? Um, differently, it was a point to where my dad was finished with doing what he did, so it was really not a transition. So it was kind of like I'm finished, here you go, type of situation. So it was learned by the seat of your pants, really, and you learn from your mistakes, you know, I've made enough of them over the years, uh, being an owner of an inter integrator, and um, with that said, the transition I think is really really critical, taking that skill set and that knowledge base, and if you have the person that fits that skill set, um, you need to start handing things off, as George was saying, you gotta slowly start, and it's a hard thing to do, is to slowly give them responsibility and walk away, and they have to learn their lessons as well. Um, in, in running a company because there's so many facets of it. Um, I was, my start was in sales and um, Alan Braun was general manager so I learned from him as well um, in sales. It was something I didn't go to college with, got college for, but ultimately it was where I ended up and I enjoy it. I love doing business development. I'm in the seat that I want to be right now. Um, so going forward, it, it, uh, the succession plan needs to be in place, and you have to slowly give over those reins to the right person and let them make those mistakes while you're still on board. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've referenced this in a couple pieces I've written, and I don't know if I've said it on the air or not. 
uh, Mike Hester, um, a gentleman who, who had an uh, integration firm in Texas, um, spoke at the NSCA uh, BLC this, this year about transitioning. And he made the most interesting comment to me, and I am not in a position where you know where we're you know, as aviation we're getting ready to sell off. But for those of you who are at least owners, and, and you know, Reed is now nowhere near retiring, but um, he did something very interesting. His succession plan was also tied to his exit tra- strategy. So he brought in people, really smart people, uh, vice presidents, and and and, and I don't know what he called them, but folks who actually ran the actual business. And over the course of three years, he stepped away from various activities to the point where the last year or two, he was pretty much just managing the managers, right? The folks that bought him out when he decided to retire point to that strategy right there as um, one of the main reasons why his, his company was valued as much as it was for the buyout because he was not tied to it, Right. So what, one of the things that's interesting is is the the principle is no longer part of the intellectual property, right? If you do this correctly, your exit strategy is going to be that much more uh, that much more uh, valuable. So I, I will I will point to that to that talk that Mike gave for probably forever. It was really good. So all right, let's talk about remote management versus uh, remote versus on site management. I should say this is from our friends over at uh, AV Magazine. If you're not familiar with, with not AV Magazine, AV Network. AVNetwork.com is a bunch of magazines. It's all New Bay folks, and it's it's some good stuff. Uh, this is from uh, Mike Hutchison, one of their uh, one of their bloggers. He starts writing about the differences between and the and the the uh, I guess the issues or the the problems with um, remote management versus on-site management, and the question that that comes in. And Rita, I want to start with you because you guys have been doing this uh, for a little bit. When it comes to that question. Um, I guess walk me through that when you're talking to, to your clients. What? Do, how do you say, okay, you know what? This is why we think you should go remote. This is why we should do remote management. These are the things, these are the positives and the benefits of, of doing a remote managed service. Or is it um, something where it really doesn't matter which one they should go with. Is, is it just comes down to the client's preference. Well, we just, uh, I'll give you an example. We just finished a large project in Kansas City, 93 rooms, all different flavors of technology in the rooms. And um, we have the smart guys here in St. Louis, programmer, engineer, and it would cost us a lot of money in order for us to do any service or maintenance um, for this particular customer, but we wanted to make sure they were taken care of. So I hired a uh, person in Kansas City, and their role is to maintain the systems for uh, for the customer in, uh, at their in their facility. Now the customer has no idea what um, they have an issue. It could be a simple uh, customer error. So there's different flavors of skill sets that you need, and you're not going to have that all in one person. So let's say your person uh, your technician goes out and tries to resolve an issue but it's a programming issue. So we remote in through laptop. He has a laptop with Biamp, Crestron already loaded. And our uh, programmer here, he's able to remote in, take uh, control of the processor, make whatever changes, and does it require him to make a trip? So it really depends on the person that's there. They have to have the knowledge to troubleshoot and be able to tell the, the engineer programmer back home what exactly is going on and what is the problem. So it's been successful for us so far. We've um, had, uh, we just had an issue with a uh, Crestron touch panel. Uh, we were able to do a swap. Our engineer downloaded the program and things worked out beautifully. So remote management, I think, is dependent on the skill set of the person you have back at home base in addition to the skill set of the person that you have at the remote location, whether it's the customer or it's the uh, or your your uh, technician, the people you have uh, on site. Real quickly, a follow up to that: What is that skill set? You know, what, for the for the remote person especially. Well, it depends on the, the uh, complexity of the systems. You know, we have different flavors. We have video conferencing. We have Cisco. We have uh, Biamp, Crestron, all of those flavors. So it is hard trying to fill out that skill set. And I've had a conversation with the customer. They, they ask me, okay, we want someone to fix it all, but you can't have somebody who fix, 
fixes everything because you have all these different flavors of manufacturers. You're not going to be able to fix it right there at that particular moment. So, but you have the ability to reach out to the intellectual talent that might be located somewhere else, whether it's the manufacturer or it's your engineer programmer that's back at home base. So I think it's really dependent on the customer, what they require from a response from you. Um, it could be like a tier one, tier two type uh, technician. And I think as they go through servicing the systems, they, they're learning, constantly learning on site. And so, you know, maybe six months down the, year, down the road, they're gonna understand the customer better and they'll understand what type of problems that are going on, so. Right, very good. Noble, from your standpoint, which, uh, I guess, the best point is which is better or, or does it depend? Right, so I think Rita, she hit on uh, several points there, but uh, the last one she made about the customer, I think that's really important. Um, you know, for a client that, say, a, a government client that requires, um, you know, 24-7 uptime, uh, maybe it makes sense in that environment to have someone on site. Uh, maybe your programmer can be remote, but maybe you need that individual on site um, for critical situations, whereas maybe you have the the corporate customer who's Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and their type of system doesn't um, have the necessity for an on-site individual, and so maybe that remote management makes more sense. Maybe it's more cost-effective. So I think it really depends, like Rita said, on the customer. I think it depends on the, the complexity of the system um, and, and and just you know what makes sense for that uh, that particular installation or for that particular customer. All right, Mr. Tucker, you uh, Mr. Tucker has gone through an interesting uh, month and a half. Um, Company he works for it full time is called World Stage. They do a lot of upfronts in New York. Um, so some of that is is building out, but some of that is also supporting that and making sure that Hulu or or I don't know if you had Hulu, but you know some of the none of these upfronts go you know, that that they go off without a hitch hmm. because there are millions and billions of dollars on the line here. So remote or or on site or a combination of both. Well, I think Noble and Rita hit on that. It's a it's a balance. Right between what you need on site, because sometimes the hands there are necessary, a broken piece, a cable that needs re-soldering, equipment replaced, that kind of thing. Uh, but for you know our economics, the most valuable one, of course, is remote if it can be done. Can I help you do this over the phone? And while both require a special need, the guy on the phone, the person on the phone, is a different talent. Not all excellent techs can be a phone person because even with a camera or even with a remote desktop, you need to be able to visualize what's going on. And have you been proved, have you been, has the tech been given the tools to do it? Not just the skill set, but do they have a current red line drawing? Are they familiar with the equipment? Have they done enough installs where in their mind's eye they can see where the person on the phone isn't telling them that one detail? And we've joked about this apophical story all the time about, you know, is the switch on? Yes. Well, which switch? You know, he was looking at the left one, you were talking about well, the right do, one. Do the facts story. Oh, geez. Well, that, that's an apophical story from the old Apple, uh, you know, you wouldn't believe days, Apple books. Uh, early days of faxes, the quick story is a woman calls in, won't fax. Guy goes, you know, okay, well, you have the document on screen. Yes, I do. Hit fax. What happens? Nothing. Check the phone line. Remember phone lines. Do all these other things. Finally, to the hint, he goes, okay, I've asked you to change something. What does it show on screen now? She goes, well, hold on a minute. i got to move the paper. And he says, what? Which well, goes, well, I put the document on the screen. Those kind of things are what we go through when we're remote supporting. You really have to be attentive to those kind of ideas. Otherwise, you're just not going to be you know, successful. So that, that special talent, as well as being a good tech, is, is the more difficult. So economically, it works out because it's three or four guys in one room. They can handle multiple callers, multiple sites. But you know, if I'm a government or a huge corporation, I need a hands-on guy. I need to have them come in, fix it, get it done, because I don't have time to be on the phone. And I don't want my maintenance guy to be dealing with it. I don't want the secretary to be dealing with it. I want you to be dealing with it. Remote, as long as it's... remote is, is having the person being able to troubleshoot. And having mm. that right person, whether it's an on-site person who knows how to troubleshoot, that's a skill set that you cannot teach. That mm. is something that you have to learn on experience. And my, um, you know, the person that we have here, who's my husband actually, he um, he's has over 20 years of experience and he can troubleshoot over the phone and that is something that you just cannot learn in a classroom. Right. It's so, a visualization thing. It's all right. in here. It's in your head. Right. Yeah. So. Tim, you made a, a point earlier about um, 
the options for having both of those, an on-site mm -hmm. person and remote. And I was hoping Rita could kind of address that. Where, when does it make sense to, to have both uh, on-site and remote management? We do. It depends what the customer is looking for, but it with our customer in Kansas City, we've done both. So um, it depends on what the problem is. If it's a restaurant or buy up related issue, then we need to get remote management, uh, you know, get the access to it. So we have to look at his schedule. When is he available in addition to the schedule when the guy can be on site? So you have to manage all of that um, time frame. So when he gets into the room and you're at the mercy of when the customer lets you in the room, sometimes you get kicked out of the room. So it could be kind of tricky uh, with that. So the, the programmer is either sitting on site or they're sitting in their office and, be, and they're able to get more work done versus waiting on the customer. So you have somebody who has a laptop ready to go and once they can get in the room, they could do the remote in. It's been actually very effective for us at this point. Um, we just did a programming job for one of our customers and the site is in a remote location and this was just a couple days ago my husband is driving to Savannah Georgia to pick our daughter up from college and our 15 year old daughter is with him he actually had to be support Crestron by amp support so he let my 15 year old daughter drive the car while he was in the passenger seat on his laptop being support for somebody in a different country so it wow. is very possible yes interesting yeah that that's the first one Dar driving down the road being support yes with a 15 year old in the rain that she's never driven <laughs> well, see I wasn't gonna go down that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I heard that story the other day I couldn't believe it but they I mean he made it work and they were able to, and it was a, a mixture of Crestron, and buy up and, and Cisco and they worked through it and it the key to it too is the person that was on site is very knowledgeable. He's a master programmer and he they worked through it together and with his troubleshooting experience they were able to get the system up and running. Yeah, and that right there is is key. I mean there there's there are very few things that experience that that can trump experience, right? Um, because there are things that when people joke if you if you're if you're new to the industry and you hear somebody joke about um, you know, uh, pins two and three, and which one's hot, right? Um, that's that's a well, it's two things actually. It's it's a two thirty two joke, and it's a it's a mic joke, a uh, microphone, a, a Canon a XLR connector joke, um, and, and the other part of that joke for two thirty two folks, for control folks, you know, uh, is that if if nothing works, fl uh, swap, swap pins two and three. Well, you know how people found out about that, and why people joke about it, and why it's funny to us poor programmers is because we've been there and we've done that. So a million a times. million billion times. And you know what's even better is when you swap them and nothing works and you swap them back and it magically works. That's awesome. <laughs> Sorry. It happens I, so often. It yeah. happens that's, so often. That's because you rubbed your feet on the carpet as you went to it. You know? I'm certain that's <laughs> a <little> jump start. Basically <laughs> what it was. All right. <laughs> Let's do this last one here and get you guys out of here for a long, well, a long, long-ish weekend before some of us go to the to Vegas. Um, this is interesting. Uh, it's got, it's uh, from our buddies over at Commercial Integrator, Mike uh, Georgie. I don't know. I should have asked about this. How to pronounce this person's name? G I O R G I. Um, he's talking about backnet, and so his title of the article is "How to Save Energy and Increase Productivity with Backnet." Now. George, I'm going to start with you on this one. George is, is I wasn't kidding when I say George is on the left side of my brain. George is also our executive producer. He handles all 99% of our shows, and one of them is is our light uh, our lighting uh, guy show. Mm -hmm. um, and JB is, is is a lighting designer. He also, uh, his co-host, and forgive me, I forgot her name. It just went out of my head. Uh, yeah, you've got me again, too. yeah. Um, they deal Andrea. with this stuff. Andrea, thank yeah. you. Um so no, it's, I'm, it's Megan. I'm sorry, it's Megan. <laughs> Anyhow, JB is our wedding host, and he has a co-host. So whatever, whatever her name is, I'm sure she's lovely. Megan. Um, yeah, it's Megan. Uh, talk to me about BackNet for a second, because here's the thing. This is something that up until, I'm going to say, four years ago, nobody in, uh, very few people in the AV industry did anything with, right? Mm. Then two of the main, main, major control manufacturers started Starting saying, oh hey, there's this thing over here. Back then, it's been around a long time. Okay, this is not anything necessarily new. In fact, some would argue that Backnet is old and going away. Hmm. So, 
is it something that we should be messing with, or should we just say, you know what, that's cool, Groovy, just give me an IP drop, and I'll talk to everything over over uh, over the network. Well, first of all, BACnet does have an IP component these days, so it has since probably 1999. Uh, you said it's old. That's right. It was established, I think, in 1985, 87. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but it's it's one of those protocols that has been around a long time and has been established and used by the major commercial industrial manufacturers. This is uh, Johnson Controls and Carrier, and it has a lot of popularity with the HVAC folks for big industrial buildings because it's easy to implement it is rugged, it has a really good track record, and it's an open protocol. There is an open protocol, so almost any manufacturer can utilize it and put it in, and you can be almost guaranteed that it's going to work, maybe not in a hot swap, but it will work with very little effort. Uh, I'm sure there's others who will bitch and moan about whether or not that's true, but in essence, it is. In Um, essence. In essence. Now, the the reality is that they're probably undergoing the same thing we are, with apps and phones and the Amazon Echoes taking over small portions of our market. The same thing is happening to them where direct IP access to these devices provides the same if not more efficient system uh, control. The truth is though, that this is going to be around for a while because there are literally millions of devices, especially in Europe, which use BACnet and rely on it. And those things are built to last 20, 30, 40 years with only minor maintenance. You know, their, their uh, usage before failure rates are very, very high. So, And the guys in the industry, like when we were talking about JP, mm-hmm. he mentioned that he sort of sees it akin to DMX. In the lighting sort of architectural world, DMX is known. In the theatrical world, it's used extensively. Um, but in, in, in the, uh, I'm sorry, in the architectural world, it's there, but it's still being overtaken by the other formats. But we use it because a lot of installations put it in. Again, is it going away? I think eventually, but not for a good number of years. Well, in 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 the in the architectural world, I mean, I honestly, IP is taking over. Um, yeah. Even before DMX, um, DMX has has plus and minuses. You've got several different universes you can do, and especially a lot of, a lot of the LED uh, architectural lighting is requiring all those different universes. And if you don't know what a universe is, it's 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 a it's an individual point in your architecture or in your in your um, network, DMX network, I'm using the wrong words and I know that, but I'm trying to transport between two different things, um, where you call out a specific command. So for every color on your LED, you need a different DMX channel. For every movement, you need a different mm. DMX Yeah, True? you're close, but yeah, there's yeah, channels. Close. There's 512 okay. channels each universe can per have universe. up to 512. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a very interesting protocol that allows you to do because there's color changers now. But, so you're you, not but doing you, a need, you need all those commands, don't you, for for every color? And okay. Well, uh, for every, yeah, it's a running continuous kind of thing. Yeah. Think MIDI. It's very similar to MIDI. It's a 485 protocol. Sorry, I just got too deep. But. You got way <laughs> too deep because most of us don't remember what MIDI is. Or 45. Or 45. Yeah. So. But yeah, I mean, the main essence though is that a a legacy system is still very viable and will be sold for the near future, and given the you know the the legacy or the sorry the lifespan of these this equipment, it's not going away, right. not for a long shot. All righty then. Um, so, yeah, all right. I have yes, a sir. question. Two. Uh, maybe maybe George knows the answer. So oh, from uh, an AV manufacturer standpoint, you know what percentage of the industry is has products that have this back net protocol built into them? Is it a a, a large percentage, a small percentage, is it expected to increase, you know? Well, I can answer that. I'm going to do it in abstract because I'm not an industry insider for that factor. But seeing as almost 90% of every industrial manufacturer of HVAC, lighting and cooling systems, uh, even some mechanical systems use a back net or something similar, I, I would say that a good, if you're in commercial buildings, I'd say a good 70% of what you're going to encounter will have its capability. Whether or not they're using it for extensive reasons is another story. But And from there. the AV side of that, I'm going to say that maybe 20% are there when it comes oh, wow. to AV control systems. Um, it's a lot like DMX. I, I hate to make that, make that comparison again, but for a long time, um, getting DMX control from a, a typical um, AV control system was nigh on impossible. 
and it's just been the last few years. I mean, yes, and, and I'm going to get calls and phone emails from Crestron. Oh, yeah, we've had a DMX controller. Yeah, but it sucked for a lot of years. Oh. Uh, it did. It was horrible. And you could only get it from Europe for many years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because it stunk. Uh, so that's a whole other story. All right. Uh, that's going to do it. Uh, thank you guys so much. Noble, we'll start with you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. It's been a, it's been a blast. Absolutely. How do people find you or Video Social Creative? Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter at uh, Noble Crawford or the website videosocialcreative.com. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Miss Rita, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for, for joining us and, and giving us your insight. Yes, thanks, Tim, for the invite. I appreciate it. It was a great time. I actually enjoyed it. Um, well, good. You can find me at uh, communitronics.com, and I'm also on LinkedIn, so if you want to see what uh, link, uh, do LinkedIn. I'm not social media savvy yet, so some maybe someday somebody, one of my kids can teach me how to Twitter. <laughs> you, you need to talk to Noble. He does a good job with that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll hook up at uh, Vegas, maybe. That yep. was good. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Tucker, thank you, sir. Thank you for having me on again. Oh, yeah. How do people find you? Oh, of course. Uh, at Tucker2 is on almost every social media platform that you can find, some even dead ones. Uh, and I write for Commercial Integrator, Higher Ed Tech, and a few others, as well as the blog. George still has a profile on Friendster. I'm just going to put that out there. No, um, FriendFeed. FriendFeed, FriendFeed. And Friendster. Is Friendster still mm -hmm. a thing? Or do they get bought by some? I don't know. Uh, my name is Tim Albright. <laughs> don't follow me on anything, because at this point, I'm still grousing that the Blues are out of the playoffs. Um... But do me a favor. Go by the website, avnation.tv. avnation.tv, you'll find this program and a host of others. Um, in Rita mentioned Vegas. We will be in Las Vegas. Uh, well, I will be in Las Vegas starting Sunday, uh, building our fabulous booth. Um, and um, go by the way, our, our, our booth is, is in, in, in is in Nancy, 2821. Um, a week from today, on Friday, from 2 to 4, local time in Vegas, we'll be doing this very program live. Uh, Mr. Tucker will be on. We will also have a couple of I'm, I'm I'm not that I'm not excited about the rest of my guests, but I'm really excited about one specific time. Uh, we're going to have Mr. Uh, Mike Blackman from ISC and Dave Lebuskus on at the same time. So that's that's kind of cool. That that was really cool. Um, and uh, huh? Two titans. Two titans. Two titans. Um, <laughs> and uh, then our our tweet up. Uh, come by the the tweet up. It's free food and drink for two hours, four to six local time again. Uh, Vegas room and is a Nancy two o five. Uh, that's on Thursday. So it's a great networking event. You don't have to be on, on social. Bring your business cards and just meet some really cool people. Um, but, yeah, that's that's all next week. Plus, just check out the website. If you're not going to Vegas and you want to uh, watch uh, our perspective on, on Infocom, uh, check out the website all week long, avnation.tv. Avnation.tv, thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for watching. This has been AV Week. <laughs>